السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الواحد الأحد الفرد الصمد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد وأحمده عز وجل حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه حمدا يليق بجلال وجهه وبعظيم سلطانه ما دامت السماوات والأرض ومن بعد أن تزولا أبدا سرمدا وأصلي وأسلم على نبيه وخليله سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطاهرين الطيبين وأصحابه الصالحين الغر الميامين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين رب اكتبنا منهم آمين On Ramadan On Saum And on the inner dimensions of Saum Allah Azza wa Jal I must remind myself and then you, my sisters and brothers, that He subhanahu wa ta'ala created us for one ultimate purpose. And that purpose is explicitly stated in the Qur'an in most unequivocal terms. When Allah Azza wa Jalla says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Which means, I have created jinns and humans for the only purpose that they fulfill ibudiyah to me. And the fulfillment of ibudiyah is the raison d'être of human beings in this universe. Philosophers throughout their lives and throughout millennia have been trying to answer the question, why are we here? Scientists try to answer the question, what are we here? Uh, or what are the physical mechanisms and the physical laws that govern our existence here? But they do not claim to answer the question as to why we are here. Philosophers who have e attempted to do that have always been unsuccessful and some have had their own answers. Allah Azza wa saved humanity the thousands of years of research and of investigation to answer that question. You and I are here in this universe to fulfill ibudiyah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember that. And what is ibudiyah? Ibudiyah, perhaps if I can reduce it to to one explanatory statement is that when I live in this universe and my objectives and my intents are in accordance to the intent of the Creator, when the intent of the creature is subservient to the intent of the Creator, that is how I attain ibudiyah. The rest are details and commentaries. In other words, every aspect of my life, every second of my life, is so designed by me, so that my intents behind my actions, my intents behind my deeds and words, my intents even by the actions of my own heart, of my qalb, are in accordance to the intent of the Creator of my heart and of myself and of everything. 
And that is the consequence of that, that as a human being, I shall attain peace inside of me. And when I attain peace inside of me to whatever degree, I will be able to actualize peace outside of me to that same degree. Why? In a sense, if I give you a rhetorical argument, Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran is described as the peace, as salam. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam describes him also as the source of peace. Allahumma anta as salam wa minka as salam. And since he is the peace and the source of peace, he invites us to the home of peace. Wallahu yad'u ila dar as salam, says he subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran. He says, and God, Allah, invites to the home of peace. And therefore, if I want to be at peace, if I want to have peace inside of me first, and outside of me consequently, where should I go? I should go to the source of peace. For example, if I need to drink water, and imagine you're in, in a desert, and there is a well of water, there is a source of water. If I stay away from the source of water, will I be able to quench my thirst? No, I will be too far from it. Will I be able to give to someone else to drink from that source of water? No. But the nearer I am to the source of water, the more I quench of my thirst, and the more I can give others to drink. So it is, if I stay away from the source of peace, I will not drink from the source of peace, and therefore I will be unable to give others to drink from peace. The nearer I am to it, the more I have of it. And being nearer to the source of peace to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a physical nearness of course, unlike the analogy with the physical, with the water source, but it is a nearness with, how? With my qalb my heart. And when I say heart, I don't mean by that this physical piece of flesh. But when we say heart, when we say qalb in this context, it is this inner characteristic and quality that is somehow connected with the physical heart, but is not itself the physical heart. So nearness to Allah Azza wa is by that innermost feeling and burst of connectedness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with your qalb, you would have to feel it, you would have to experience it. I cannot describe it to you because it is not four dimensional. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for us to attain that nearness to the source of peace, to him subhanahu wa ta'ala, he required and he taught that we basically do two things. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes and summarizes in one way the mission of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, هو الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته ويزكيهم ويعلمهم الكتاب والحكمة وإن كانوا من قبل لفي ضلال مبين which means it is he God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who sent amongst the unlettered peoples a messenger from among themselves in order to rehearse for them the signs of Allah 
and to cleanse and purify them, yuzakihim, and to impart upon them the knowledge of the book and of wisdom. Within that purpose of ibudiyah, the means is attainment of knowledge and purification of inner self. And when we do those, then we will begin to undertake the journey of nearness to the source of peace. To the extent that Sharia, the way of Rasulullah as he exemplified also the divine teaching in the Arabic language means the path, the trodden path to the source of water. The trodden path to the source of water. And that's not a real physical source of water. It symbolizes and exemplifies again this path of nearness, this journey of the heart along the footsteps of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of nearness with the heart to God, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where does Siyam comes into this? It has a lot to do with this. For your nafs and mine, your inner self and mine, are always, are always subjected to challenges and trials, are always subjected to undertake a road and a path that is not necessarily a path of inner peace, and therefore of nearness to Allah, and therefore of attainment of happiness in this world and in the hereafter. Do you get angry sometimes? Do you get afraid sometimes? Do you hate sometimes? Do you feel selfish sometimes? Do you feel arrogant sometimes? Do you have prejudices sometimes? And I can go on the list. Those are the inner ailments within me that prevent me from attaining peace within me by being near to the source of peace. And when I don't have peace inside of me, I cannot give peace outside of me. فَاقِدُ الشَّيْءِ He who or she who does not have of something cannot give of it. In Islam, we like to speak of freedom from self, not freedom of self. To be truly liberated, to be truly free, is to be free from the yokes and the chains of the self. That is freedom. Freedom of the self is in reality yokes put upon the ability to be free and really free. If I asked you the question, even in terms of knowledge, will you be freer to be intellectually even more knowledgeable of the source of knowledge or to be less knowledgeable of the source of knowledge. Which one makes you freer? Knowledge liberates and frees. But we know that indulging the self, and we don't have time to go through the details of that, indulging the self and observing the freedom of the self without proper restraints and proper controls and norms, 
actually disengages me from that freedom of exalting in knowledge. For example, if you are busy loving to eat, if you're busy loving to eat and you love food and different types of food and different qualities of food and quantities of food, and if that's what you want to do most of the time and to drink, will you be able to be a smart student at, at class? I don't think so. Because you'll be all the time full and lazier and want to sleep more than to think. And then when you eat more, it engages you in other feelings that you want to do and other things. And eating more and being focused on eating more does not engage you intellectually. It disengages you intellectually if you eat excessively or if you're focused on eating and eating only. Don't you agree? If you're focused on, let's say, doing other things, of having fun, your nafs, yourself, you want to give it freedom of what it wants, and it wants to have fun. And you indulge in all types of entertainments and funs, and, and you have the television, and you keep switching and switching, and the internet, and you keep switching into it, and, and browsing, and strolling, and then you keep doing that, will that engage you intellectually? To be an A student? I don't believe so, and I know that it is not so. So intends to liberate us. Fasting as prescribed by Allah Azza wa Jal, intends to liberate us. That every day when I'm eating every day and drinking every day and focusing on sometimes many of us on material consumerist things every day, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from His rahmah, from His love and compassion upon us, He disengages us from that addiction to food, and drink, and on and on. So that we realize that there is life beyond eating. So that there is joy, and there is pleasure, and there is happiness, the source of which is not directly physical and materialistic, is not food. And so that I don't continue to be addicted to that and to, re to continue to think and, and, and live as if physical nourishment is, is, underline is, the means and way to pleasure, i.e. to happiness. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does that for us from his rahmah, also for salah for the daily salawat, five daily salawat. Five times a day, we must, at least five times a day, we must interrupt what we are doing. And what we are doing usually is mundane, is temporal. So to train us to realize that I must break, so that I don't become dependent, addicted, a prisoner of what I do daily. And I break so that my nafs, my inner self, does not get used to being in a state of focus on the material things and the mundane and the worldly things. A lot of his rahmah breaks that habit, that addiction for me, so that I realize that there is something else, and assume I continue to do that, just that, just that, just that, there is not a break 
for me to be inward, to look inside of me. And therefore all the world, what it is for me is what it is outside. And that's detrimental to me. And that's how my heart dies. That's how I develop more and more inner ailments of more greed, of more arrogance, of more prejudice, and so on and so forth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breaks that for me. So some fasting at least once during the year for one month, in addition to the highly recommended days for fasting, Mondays and Thursdays and three days a month and, and some months and, and so on. All of those are for me an opportunity to liberate myself from the attachment and therefore the addiction that I may develop for other things that are not all things in life. For God's sake, everyone here knows that I am not only a physical being. Or am I? Or are you? You know that you go to sleep and you dream. And your dreams, in your dreams, you travel in the future, don't you? In your dreams, you travel into the past, don't you? That is not the characteristic of a physical dimension. You are more than that. You feel pain, don't you? Not physical pain, emotional pain, don't you? And I know many of us these days are in pain. You feel joy, don't you? Is that four dimensional? And then you go to school, you think, don't you? Is that physical? And how dare human beings say to themselves or impose on others philosophies of life that are utterly materialistic and therefore focus institutions and actualization of those institutions' philosophies about eating and sleeping and drinking and copulating and playing and so on. That's it. Hold on. Hold on, I am not just a stone. I'm not just atoms of matter. I know that. And it is normal that I know that I need things that I, that I don't have anything to do with eating and drinking and copulating and, and sleeping all the time. So how can I forget them? And how do I nourish them? They're not nourished by eating and sleeping and drinking and copulating and playing. I must try to find out at least if I don't know. And don't expect commercials about being good. Commercials about being generous. Commercials about being forgiving. Commercials about being uh, humble, be humble. You know, commercials about eat this and drink that and do this and play that and so on. But have you ever seen commercials about be kind, be generous, be hospitable, be forgiving, be humble, be moral. Think of your heart, don't think only of your stomach. We don't have those commercials because those who don't think that way don't have it in themselves again and they don't know better. Ramadan so liberates me, my brothers and sisters. It liberates me from that addiction. I begin to know that there is really life beyond physical life. That there is joy beyond material joy. Wallahi alladhi la ilaha illahu.
During Ramadan, when I abstain voluntarily from those elements that I mentioned, I also begin not only to talk about kindness and compassion, but to feel kindness and compassion. When I voluntarily stop from eating from the morning, from dawn till sunset, voluntarily so, then perhaps if I do that with focus, then I begin to realize what it means to be homeless. Not to have even a home to go to, to eat. At least when we fast, we have a home to go to, to break our fast. And if you are involved internally with your psalm, then you begin to know what it means to be hungry. And your hunger is by choice. But there are those who are hungry by necessity. And they don't have homes to go to, to break their fast. If I understand what psalm means, it will enable me to develop consequently compassion and care for those in need, for those desperate, for those homeless, for those who are hungry. I not only talk about it, I not only give them money and give them food, but I feel it. I have been there. And especially, and because also, that my brothers and sisters, Hafizakumullah, Wa'iyana, that Psalm is not celebrating eating. It's celebrating not eating. It's celebrating an inner dimension of fulfillment and of nourishment. Do you know what I am get, where I am getting at? Because during the month of Ramadan first, it seems in the Muslim world and Muslims overall have developed this habit of eating more during Ramadan than outside of Ramadan. More money is spent. This is true. This is statistical. More money is spent on food and of desserts in Ramadan than outside of Ramadan. Subhanallah, from celebrating the ruh, from celebrating the qalb, which are not nourished by physical food, we continue to celebrate food. To the extent that even non-Muslims, many of them are known to write on Ramadan, and in part of what they write in their articles, in their columns about the types of food, and the types of succulent foods and delicious desserts that are prepared in Muslim homes on the occasion of Ramadan. And there are even recipes for Ramadan, right? Recipes for Ramadan of food. Subhanallah. Is this what it is intended to celebrate? That is perhaps, forgive me to say, why many of us do not benefit from Saum. And that's the only benefit that we get from Saum is having been hungry and thirsty for a certain amount of hours during 24 hours. Yet, Ramadan is about celebrating, not eating, to discover a joy and a pleasure, not in the realm of the physical, but in the realm of the qalb, in the realm of the ruh, or if I borrow the term, in the realm of the spiritual. So when I break my fast, I eat with vengeance. Some of us, we're fasting, and then when we break our fast, we eat with vengeance. And that means my qalb was not involved in fasting. 
only my depriving myself from food and drink. And it is sometimes more challenging to be forbearing and patient when there is no food than when there is food. You agree with me? That's why when food is put on the table, when you have not eaten before, many of us eat with vengeance. Because the qalb is not involved. Yet, we are taught and instructed to break our fast with very really light food. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا أفطر يفطر على تمر أو على تمرة أو ماء. That when he broke his fast, صلى الله عليه وسلم, he ate one piece of date or few pieces of date, and if there isn't some water. And then we go to salah after that, and we expect to focus on salah. And we have eaten so much. That when you eat so much, what happens to the mind? What happens to the nafs? The nafs is enslaved. And it has enslaved you. And therefore your mind sleeps. And I come to salah bored, yawning, sometimes even, forgive me, burping. And yet salah is a connectedness of the human qalb with Allah Azza wa Jal. That's what salah is. The essence of salah is the connectedness of your qalb with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you know, to the extent that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches that the value of a salah of an individual is worth only the extent of the presence of his heart or her heart in that salah. لَيْسَ لِلْمَرْءِ مِنْ صَلَاتِهِ إِلَّا مَا عَقِلَ مِنْهَا احْفَظُوا قُلُوبَكُمْ فِي الصَّلَاةِ كُلُّ هَذَا جَاءَ عَنْهُ صلى الله عليه وسلم لَوْ خَشَعَ قَلْبُ هَذَا لَخَشَعَتْ جَوَارِحُهُ وَهَكَذَا If the heart of this individual were in focus, then his or her limbs would be in focus, speaking about salah. And yet when I eat so much, I lose that focus. I discover through fasting that there is, I repeat, life and there is pleasure and there is joy outside of eating and sleeping and drinking and copulating. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam teaches and watch what food does when we eat excessively or in a way that is not properly balanced. And Ramadan is to help us. Fasting is to help us to bring that balance. But when we are focused, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa teaches, أَنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ يَجْرِي مَجْرَ الدَّمِ فِي بْنِ آدَمْ That shaitan, actually, if, if, if I translate it literally, he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what means that shaitan or, or the devil runs inside the child of Adam as the blood runs inside the veins of the child of Adam. Yajri majaraddam. Or even it may mean that shaitan runs within the course of the blood in the veins of the human being. It's a very interesting thing. That's why you find many early scholars, rahimahumullah ta'ala, they say, dayiqu that's why they would, they would teach that restrain and narrow down the passages of shaitan inside the human veins by fasting. It's interesting, this physical connection, yet the intent of it is in the other world. Shaitan is not a physical entity. It's beyond that. It can have perhaps the ability to transform and to materialize because it's an extraterrestrial being. Whereas we are unable to enter its dimension, that shaitan is able to enter our dimension. That's what the ayah says. He has access to our dimension, we don't have access to his. 
and yajri majraddam. Think about this. And if you take it literally, that somehow, however, the result of that is moral and spiritual, shaitan runs in your veins and mind, in which the blood runs, and the blood is fed by what you eat. And then if we eat properly and balanced, and we fast, physically in other words, there will not be nourishment inside that blood for shaitan. The course of shaitan, the path of shaitan inside of our veins will be narrowed. It's very interesting, isn't it? Saum also, my dear brothers and sisters, as Rasulullah teaches, is a Jannah. A Saum Jannah is a shield, is a protection. And that is consistent with what Allah Azza wa Jalla says, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودَاتٍ when Allah Azza wa Jalla teaches that Psalm was prescribed upon us as it was prescribed upon those before us, in order that we attain taqwa. In order that we attain taqwa. And what is taqwa? Taqwa derives from the Arabic word waqa yaqi. And it taqa yattaqi. Waqa which means to protect, to shield. And it taqa which means to protect oneself. And therefore, taqwa is a noun derived from that meaning, which means to shield oneself, to protect oneself. From what? Again, from the ru'una of the nafs and from the impact of shaitan. To protect the, the human being from the um, excessive indulgences of the self that lead to chain the individual to be addicted to the self and also frees us and protects us, I'm sorry, and protects us from the wrath and the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because I and you who want to seek nearness to the source of peace, I do not want to be on the journey to do things that will deviate me from that source of nearness, from that course, I'm sorry, of nearness to peace. And that's one way you can put it when you speak of the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that displeasure comes by me deviating away from that path that brings me nearer to Him. And the result is that I am the loser emotionally, morally, intellectually, and physically, and so on. So I shield myself from that. And the consequence is for me pain and misery in this life, one way or the other, and in the life to come. So to shield myself from that. Psalm is an invisible shield around you from those things. And when you are fasting, you have focused your spiritual energies instead of focusing your food energies and your, and your physical energies. And when you focus your spiritual and moral energies, what will they be good for? Good enough for me, give me strength, phys physical, I'm sorry, moral and spiritual strength to face the challenges of the nafs. Not the physical challenges. Many times, right, it's so difficult for me to do good. It's so difficult for me to refrain from harm and from that which is destructive and from that which is bad. And I feel weak even when I want it. True or false? I want to do good, but I, but I just can't. I, I'm, I'm taken, I'm taken in this course of not being able to do good. And it is easier for me to do wrong. It's easier for me to violate the norms of decency and of morality and of goodness. And I, because I could be very strong, I could be a football player, could be Mr. Universe. Nowadays they have Mrs. Universe or Miss Universe or something like that. But Mr. Universe and Miss Universe 
are unable to control a desire to do harm, an immoral impulse, very weak, true or false. Because there is no spiritual strength and moral strength. And in Ramadan, I develop spiritual and moral strength. And I'll be able, more able to do good than before. Especially if I focus. I'll be less prone to do wrong than before. Especially when I focus. The path to do good becomes easier for me. And this leads me to the next point. If I asked you a show of hand as Muslim sisters and brothers here, how much difference is there in your life between Ramadan and outside of Ramadan of being consistent with your salah and go to the masjid? Raise your hands. Raise your hands, those for whom it makes a difference from Ramadan and outside of Ramadan of, for example, being more consistent in salah and going more to the masjid and being more compassionate. Raise your hands. Most of you. Statistically proven all the time. Wallahi al -Azim. I look at Ramadan as a dear friend. This is what Ramadan is for me. Wallahi al -Azim. When Ramadan ends, the day it ends and before it ends, a, a terrible, a terrible... Uh, uh, type of, of sadness overwhelms me, of a loving, generous, kind friend. And now he is leaving me and almost looking once at me and says, Assalamu alaikum, I'm going. And my heart is breaking, please don't go. But he says to me, I'll see you next year. I'll be back. Wallahi al -Azim, it it breaks my heart to see Ramadan leaving a gentle, generous, good friend. Because in his presence, I was better than ever before. In his presence, I was more at peace than ever before. In his presence, I had a happiness not comparable to the other types of happiness. That friend made me, helped me to be good, and gave me peace. And I'm afraid now to lose him and then to go to the outside world. Ramadan. During Ramadan teaches Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anna shayateena tusaffad, wa anna abwaab al-jannati tuftah. وَأَنَّ أَبْوَابَ النَّارِ تُغَلَّقَ The teachings of Rasulullah is that during the month of Ramadan, the devils, those extraterrestrial hyperspace type of beings, are chained. They are chained. Think about it. The gates of Jannah, of paradise, of the home of peace. Jannah is Darul Salam. Paradise in, in the Quranic definition is called Darul Salam. The home of peace, the gates to the home of peace are wide open. And the gates to the dwelling of misery and of violence and of Jahannam and of hell are locked. Subhanallah, did you think about this and what it means? Number one, this seems to tell us that during the month of Ramadan, Rahma is optimized. Love and compassion and mercy are optimized, really, in the universe. In other words, there is a change in the state of the universe and in the relationship of human beings with the universe. The universe, Allah Azza wa the creator of the universe and the creator of time, affects time and space during Ramadan so that Jannah is nearer to us. It's like there, God, the gate is there. 
The gates of hell are made very far. It's like a window of opportunity in time open for me to journey into the hyperspace of Rahmah of Allah Azza wa It's very close, it's there. Have you ever felt very, very close sometimes when you are in dua? More than before when you are in supplication and invocation to Allah and your qalb was in there and you felt so near so near and so longing and desiring for God. A non-Muslim scholar wrote once about his experience in Hajj. I forgot his name, who went there and, and disguised himself as a Muslim, I think last century. and experienced Hajj. And then he wrote in a book, and this was communicated to me, I did not read the book. And the brother who communicated it, it to me is a very dear brother of mine, originally from Somalia. And he said, and the man wrote that, that the, the top of his experience of Hajj is when he was in front of the Kaaba, and there was this African man, middle-aged man, between his 30s and 40s. And he said, in, and he suddenly fell on the floor in dua to Allah Azza wa and he said, Ya Allah, take me now. This is not a call of desperation, if you know what that means if you know the experiences. This is not a call of suicide. This is a call of hub and of shawq. His heart was in a state of being connected. And then his heart saw the divine beauty and longed to go to Allah. Then his Iman, his heart opened and saw and was overwhelmed with peace as his qalb connected to Allah and said, Ya Allah, now. Wallahi al -Azim, sometimes moments, very short moments, maybe, take the heart in a journey of peace and of connectedness. Ya Allah, now. But Allah knows better than you and me. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more generous than you and me. And is more giving than you and me. And He gives more respite to you and me. And His gates in Ramadan are more open than before. There are moments in, the, in time and in space, both created by Allah Azza wa that God Allah Azza wa assigned a special time and special space in which the individual human beings, the human being is near to God. He chose to be so. For example, when you are in your salah, in sujood, in prostration, that's a time in which one is nearest to God. Time doesn't mean anything. Space doesn't mean anything. أَقْرَبُ مَا يَكُونُ الْعَبْدُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ وَهُوَ سَاجِدٌ when he said, the messenger Muhammad said, the point of maximum nearness of an individual to his or her Lord is when that individual is in sujood, in prostration, in salah. So be sure to be in constant dua, invocation inside that salah.
And there are many other windows during the day and during the month and during the year, in time and in space, when you are next to the Kaaba. That's a window in space, subhanallah, where space and hyperspace come very close together and you feel that nearness, you feel like you can, you can knock, subhanallah, you can knock in space at the door between you and the next world. I think it, what was it, um, what's his name, the, the, the American, uh, uh, Michael Wolf, I think it was, when he went to Hajj of ABC and he, he was a Muslim. And it was two years ago, I think, or three years ago, and he was reporting from Mecca. And Ted Koppel was asking him questions. And, and Michael Wolf, I was told, he said, you know, Ted, here you feel the presence of God. Here you feel the presence of God. is a window of space, subhanAllah, where one is nearest to Allah Azza wa And we try to develop our qalb so that it is nearer and near to Allah Azza wa Jal, wherever it is in space and time. And Ramadan is an opportunity. And he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the shayateen, the devils are trained, the gates of Jannah are made closed, they're open, the gates of hell are closed. And it is like Allah is saying, come ya abdi, come oh my dear servant, come back to me. Come back, tub, anib ilay, yurja, return to me. And he says that every day, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he says that all the time. But in our frame of reference, there are windows of time and in space, and of space in which that is emphasized. Every night when people are sleeping, in the second half of the night and in the latter third of the night, Islam teaches, Rasulullah teaches that God subhanahu wa ta'ala, beyond dimensions, says, the hadith descends to this world descends to this world, close the gaps, if you will, that we perceive between us and him and this world, and he comes to this world, quote unquote, and says at that time when people are mostly sleeping or doing other things, who amongst my ibad, amongst my servant, asks me, and I will give him or her, who comes back to me and returns to me, and then I accept their repentance and I accept their return. Who and who and who come to me? And in Ramadan, it's an entire month. Come back to me. To the extent that he, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, chained the shayateen. And you know what this means? I think, and I believe, and I feel. What are the two forces usually that hold me from being good? Yes. I thought you raised your hands, I'm sorry. Young man, I, I like young people who, who want to, to contribute in khair. Allahu Akbar, I was right. This is a good young man. <laughs> Allahu Akbar, sadaqta ya bunay, hafizakallah. You spoke the truth, my son. He said, Shaitan and your qalb, he means your nafs. Yes. Take care of this young man. Ash-shaytan <laughs> wa nafs. La ilaha illallah. Hafidhak Allah ya bunay. Masha'Allah. Masha'Allah. Ash-shaytan wa nafs. These are the two forces, my nafs, my inner self, my inner inclinations. Huh? When your nafs or mind says, eat, drink, copulate, sleep, play, kill, hurt, steal, ridicule, speak, and so on. Those are the inner inclinations of the self. And shaitan. 
Now look, Rasulullah says that shaitan is chained during Ramadan. Then what is left? If shaitan is chained, what is left? My nafs. And you all go to school or have gone to school and you're college students, mashallah. And you know how to do experiments by having variables and removing this variable and this variable until you find what is that which is impacting a certain outcome, what is the cause of an outcome, right? Let's say you identify three causes or seven causes, possibly, and you begin experimenting by removing this factor and you see if there is change. And then removing this factor and you see if there is change, until when there is change you say, yes, this is a direct cause of that, true or false? Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala offers us an experiment. And we have identified the two variables that hurt us, that weaken us. Shaitan and the nafs. And one variable is removed by the one who can remove it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then I am left with, and that's an easy experiment, with the nafs. And therefore the conclusion is, during Ramadan, I discover my nafs. I truly learn about my nafs. Look, subhanAllah, the hikmah of Allah Azza wa How do I know my nafs? One fundamental way, Ramadan. And then, when I do wrong, who is to blame? The devil? But the devil Allah taught, and that's unseen, ilmu ghayb wa nu'minu bih. He said through Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the devil is chained. Oh my God. So that's from me then. And I will learn to know that I no longer under certain circumstances because of certain traits and qualities of my nafs, I no longer will say I did this because of shaitan. La'natullahi alayhi. Wa la'natullahi alayhi fi'lan. But I would know then that what I used to do outside of Ramadan, is it shaitan or is it my nafs? And subhanAllah, that's the hikmah behind, or a hikmah behind Allah Azza wa Jal, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling us that the shayateen are chained and the gates of Jannah are open. And the gates of Jannah are open. How much time do I have left? It's time, mashallah. It's time. And time has passed so quickly. And there is more, of course, that we can share with one another about Ramadan, about Saum, and about the inner dimensions of Saum. I do hope and I do ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these words, I pray, have helped, and I pray me, and you, insha'Allah ta'ala, in rising above the self, in freeing ourselves from the self, in taking the opportunity of these open windows in space and in time for us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be nearer to Him, and to remember that the experience of Saum is not about celebrating the material, the immediate, but it is about celebrating the immaterial, the mediate, the heart, the soul, the mind. Aqulu qawli hadha, wa astaghfirullah al-azim ali wa lakum, wa as'alullah an akuna awwal al-muslimin, and had I said anything correct 
It is from Allah Azza wa Jal alone. Anything improper or incorrect or defective, it's my own ignorance, the impact of shaitan upon me, and the weakness of my own self. I seek refuge in Allah that I remind you of him and yet myself forget him. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.